Amen. So Matthew chapter 20, of course, uh, last Thursday I wasn't here. I got a guest preacher, and everything I heard um, about that preaching was that it was very good. So, um, but of course, we didn't get through 20 and I, Matthew, uh, a chapter of Matthew, so I don't want to fall too far behind there. I don't know who it is we're trying to keep up with, but you know, we'll go ahead and get into Matthew tonight. Um, so it says there in verse one, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And of course, we know this this parable here, familiar with it. And it's what we would call the parable of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus often gives many of these things. And he often uses this phrase. In fact, if you were to uh, go through the book of Matthew, and as you notice as we go through it, that phrase, the kingdom of heaven, comes up quite a bit. And he gives quite a, a few descriptions about it. And he um, uses that phrase a lot to describe heaven, who's going, who isn't, how they're going to get there, how they're not going to get there. And he gives a lot of parables about the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is one of them. And really, these parables, they deal with heaven. You know, they deal with, again, those that are going to be going there. And we would recall, perhaps, Matthew chapter 5, where it says, For I say unto you that except, uh, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we have to understand, first of all, what this parable is even about. It's about people going to heaven. It's about people that are going to be saved. And he says in Matthew 5 that the people that are going to go into the kingdom of heaven are those whose righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You know, and when we first start reading the Bible, I know when I had first read this, this kind of threw me uh, for a curveball because I had this impression in my mind that the scribes and Pharisees were these uh, righteous, holy people. But as we read the scriptures and go through, we find out that they were actually hypocrites. What Jesus said of them is that they were whited sepulchers uh, beautiful in the apparent, to appearance, but on the inwardly they were full of dead man's bones. So it sounds perhaps here in Matthew 5 that that's a tall order to say that your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, but in reality, uh, it doesn't. It, that's not, that's not, well it does, but it's not a very big ask. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, but here's the thing, there's none righteous. You know, none of us are righteousness to, uh, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's Christ's righteousness is what's going to get us there. You know, maybe we would say, well, I don't really measure up to so-and-so. You know, I don't know that I can measure up to these scribes and Pharisees and, and, and working and getting into heaven and keeping the law and the commandments and doing all these things and say, that sounds like something impossible to do, that you couldn't, you know, keep the law perfectly and go to heaven. But uh, go ahead and turn over to uh, Matthew, uh, actually turn over to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3. Because we know that our righteousness is found in Christ. How is it that our righteousness is going to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? It's going to be in that we are righteous in Christ. The Bible says in Romans 4, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward uh, reckoned not of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, uh, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So it says there that our faith is what's counted to us for righteousness. It's our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is what's going to cause our righteousness to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is when our righteousness is found in the righteousness of Christ. You're there in Philippians, look at chapter 3, verse 8, where it says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but which is, of, is through uh, the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So, when we read passages there, like Matthew chapter 5, which says that our righteousness ought to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. We should understand that that is very easily accomplished when our righteousness is found in Christ, that He far exceeds their righteousness. So, but again, this parable here is about people going to heaven. And Matthew chapter 5 is an example of that, that it's, it's people who are saved through faith in Christ. Those are those that are going to enter into heaven. And really, what this parable, and, you know, there's a couple different ways we could look at it. And one way is that this parable illustrates that the reward of heaven is not based on merit, but 
but the grace of God. You know, no one's going to get into heaven, as we read earlier, that by working their way in. You know, not by their own righteousness, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His grace He saved us. So the reward uh, of heaven has always been the same. It's always been, uh, you know, we get there not based on merit, not based on how good we are, but based on the fact that it is the grace of God that takes us there. It is the righteousness that is found in Christ that even opens up the kingdom of heaven to us. And that it's available to anybody. It's available to everybody. It's not just one group of people that gets to lay claim to the kingdom of heaven and say that they have exclusive rights to it. And that, and that it's, uh, it's, it's open to everybody. And what's also interesting about this parable is that, is that God is uh, if, you know, rewarding these people here who come at the 11th hour with the same amount of money, a penny for a day's labor, as the people that started at the beginning of the day. Those that started and worked the longest shifts, they, they had the same income, they had the same uh, wage given to them as those that worked the shortest shift in the day. So it's showing us that the reward uh, for heaven is open to everybody, that it's not about our own merit. It's about the fact that God is gracious to us and willing to give us the same reward uh, whether we come you know, later in time or if we were you know, those that in the Old Testament, that it's always been the same. And it shows us, you know, that God's not, you know, He's not running a union shop. You know, He's not like, it's, going to heaven is not based on seniority. It's not based on your own merit, how long you've been around, how long you've, you know, been reading your Bible, been a Christian. It's not based on your own good works because it's by grace through faith. Amen. You know, it's the same reward for everybody regardless of their standing, how long they've been or haven't been, you know, serving God. You see there that in verse 2 where it says, And when He agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard and went about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, Go ye also to the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went, they went their way. And he went about the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle unto them. Why stand ye here all the day? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right ye shall receive. And of course we know how this goes when the day ends and they come to receive their paper, their wages. Those that had started at the beginning of the day are paid last, and those that started their uh, their day at the end are paid first, and they all receive the same amount. And those that are served, uh, those that are paid last, those who had started the shift first, they suppose, as it says there, that they were going to uh, when they and they were uh, uh, when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. They thought, man, we've been here the longest, obviously, since he's paying. These people have been here the shortest, the same amount. We're going to get more. But that's just not how it works. And, uh, and then God, and he says here, and he accuses them for saying, you know, is it not lawful for me to do uh, what I will with mine? Is thine and evil because, mine, uh, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last, for many be called, but few chosen. Now, this, this isn't something I want to really uh, delve into a lot just because of the fact that uh, this same phrase and the same illustration is used again in chapter 22. That's something that we can deal with then. But he does talk about how there are many called but few chosen. And we have to start to understand what it means to be chosen. You know, and a lot of people will say, well, this means that God chose you and that, uh, to be saved. That somehow, you know, like a Calvinist would say, that somehow God picks and chooses who will be saved. Well, that flies in the, in the face of, of a lot of Scripture. It flies in the face of the fact that the Bible says that God is not, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That He's the Savior of all men, especially them that believe. That for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting Amen. life. So it can't mean when it says there that many, uh, some are, uh, but few are chosen, that there's few people that God randomly selects, for, or however He goes about doing it, to choose to allow to come into the kingdom of heaven. But it, what it's saying there, it, when we read that word chosen, we have to understand that's meaning the elect, those that are saved. It's talking about a person who has been redeemed. And you see this, if you would, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Actually, go to Psalms 105. Psalms 105. To be chosen in the Lord just simply means to be God's people. It means to be saved, to be a, to be a member of God's family. And we all get that the same way. And it's not by, you know, God, uh, you know, working and just uh, randomly selecting us against our own free will. Yeah. That we don't have any say in the matter. We all have a choice to make in that. That's right. And 
we see that here in Psalm 105, look at verse 43, where it says, And He brought forth His people with joy, and His chosen with gladness. So who are the chosen? They're His people. So that's what it means to be chosen. That's what it means to be one of, it means to be one of God's people. That's simply what it means. And we see that again. And again, I'm not going to go into this for sake of time, just because of the fact it's coming up in the next two chapters. This is something that we can uh, deal with a little bit more. So with that in mind, let's just move right back into, the, into Matthew uh, chapter 20 and get into verse 17. Because there is a lot more here that I want to kind of look, about, uh, look at, especially towards the end here. And it says here in Matthew chapter 17, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed and the chief priests and the scribes under the chief, uh, under the chief priests and under the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. And, you know, we see this over and over again. I know I've talked about this as we're going through the book of Matthew. So often Jesus is talking about his very betrayal and the, and the things he's going to suffer. And they keep bringing up the same thing about who's going to be the greatest in heaven. We saw that, you know, at the Last Supper, you know, which is obviously takes place after this where they're sitting and he, and he tells them that he's going to be betrayed and that they, they begin to have a discussion about well who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Or when he was walking with them in the way and again telling them about how he was going to be betrayed and to be crucified and he has to ask them about you know what is it that you dispute about, about in the way. And they, they didn't answer. And that there had been a contention among them about who should be the greatest. So it's just interesting that every time he's talking about his own sufferings and the, own, the things that he's going to go through and suffer, that we find the disciples talking about something about that they really have no say in the matter. Uh, really, that's what we're going to see here in a minute. That they have, they're, they're arguing about something that really should matter. It shouldn't be uh, their concern. It seems like they're very, uh, they're not focused on what it is they need to be focused on. They're not understanding what, are the things, uh, the, what it is that Christ is trying to tell them and Jesus is trying to show them. So he says there, you know, tells them that he's go, they're going to crucify him and the third day he shall rise again. I mean, it's pretty plain, and yet they didn't understand this. They couldn't grasp this concept. And really, I think it's because they were so busy worrying about themselves that they, didn't, they couldn't really get this. You know, and that sometimes that's the way it is with us. God's trying to show us something, trying to tell us something, trying to lead us in a certain direction. But we're so busy with what we want, what we think, and how we feel about things that we kind of miss the, the message. We kind of, we don't get it. And uh, God has to kind of straighten us out a little bit. And it says here in verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee, uh, Zebedee's children with their sons, worshiping him, and desiring a certain thing of him. And, said, and he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant these that my two sons may sit the one on the right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. Now, that's not a bad request. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's a, not a bad desire to have in your heart. I mean, who wouldn't want to have that seat? You know, who wouldn't want to have uh, that place of, of being so close to Christ and being and being able to see Him rule and reign like that? I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. And Jesus going on, goes on and says and answered and said, "Ye know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with?" They say unto Him, "We are able." And he saith unto them, Ye indeed shall drink of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for who it is prepared of my Father. So really, you know, it's going to be God the Father who decides who's going to have these seats. But here's the thing, somebody's going to have them. Now, I don't know who it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be these two. It's not going to be James and John, the sons of Zebedee. We know that uh, Jesus elsewhere says that they will sit on the twelve tribes judging the twelve tribes of Israel, or twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So they've already got seats picked out for them. But, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing that she was requesting of them. And But look how the ten received it. It says in verse 24, and when the others, you know, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. I mean, here they are, mad and upset that they would have the audacity, the gall, the nerve to go and, and even desire such a thing. But remember, this is the same group of guys who elsewhere would be disputing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And again, look at the timing of it. It's always so interesting when this comes up. 
It always comes up when Jesus is talking about his crucifixion, the things he's going to suffer. And I just think it's just showing us that we sometimes are just so caught up in ourselves that we don't see what really matters in life, that we don't see what really is important. And of course, Jesus has to straighten them out here in verse 25, but, and where it says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are a great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Now again, this seems like a paradox, and it's, it's something that Jesus talks about Often in Scripture, it's something that he reminded them many times, even in the back of the book of Matthew alone, that if they wanted to rule, if they wanted to be great, they had to be willing to serve. That they had, he even used himself as an illustration, that he came not to, to be ministered unto, but to minister. You know, and of course, he, he was God, he was Christ, he set the example even at the Last Supper, you know, hours before he would go and suffer and bleed and die for them, he takes the time to gird himself and to wash their feet and to be a minister unto them as an example. He tells them, as I have done, so do you, do you also uh, to your brethren. <laughs> and so this is a real important principle in Scripture because it's something that comes up over and over and over again. You know, if people want to be great, if they want to be used of God mightily, they have to learn to serve others. I mean, that's really what the ministry is all about. It's not about self. It's not about, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what we can get out of it. You know, it's about what we can do for others. And, you know, I, I often wonder, and I was talking to uh, Brother Rich this afternoon, we were out there, about churches that don't go soul winning. They don't, they, they're, they're there, they have the King James Bible, perhaps, you know, they're, they're, they're preaching, they have some right doctrines, but they don't go soul winning. You know, they don't reach out to the lost, they don't want to preach the gospel, they're not excited about it, They and I just, oh, and I hear about it over and over and over again, it just seems like it's this, uh, just it's just the uh, the the common uh, or it's just it's just common amongst churches today uh, in Baptist churches that they just lost their zeal they lost their first love and I always I find myself wondering them why are they even going to church what is it that you're even getting out of it if it's not to serve others you know why is it that we even go and, and show up and, and and put on our best and, and come to church and sit down and listen to preaching and try to, to learn the word of God and, and if we're not doing anything with it. What's the point? You know, uh, is it just to be seen of men? Is it just to show up and so we can feel like, hey, we, we, we went to church and, and pat ourselves on the back? Or is it because we're trying to learn something and, 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 and gather with other people who desire to serve others? And really, that should be the motivation. And I don't understand why some people would even bother trying to live the Christian life and go to church and do these things if it's not to serve other people, if it's not to preach the gospel to the lost and be a help to others. And Jesus puts a lot of emphasis on it because that really is the heartbeat of a ministry is what we can do for others and serving other people. And really, that's what's going to make you great as an individual and that's what's going to make this church great. You know, here in Tucson, this church might never run, you know, uh, 50, 100, 200, 300, 400 people. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm not saying it won't, but it might never. If God sees fit, it might never. But does that mean we can't do great things? Does that mean we can't do a great work here in Tucson, even with a smaller group of people? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It's if you know we desire to be great, if we desire to be a church that God will look down on and be pleased with and would be exalted, you know, we have to be about serving others. And I think the the, the idea of going out and having a a group of believers, whether they be big or small, whether it be you know a dozen people or three dozen people that go out. And to think that a church that that size, whatever that size, you know, and somewhere in that number, uh, a smaller group of people could go out and accomplish a task like knocking every door in Tucson yeah. in a generation. I mean, that's a great work. But how is that going to be accomplished if we understand that in order to be great, we have to be willing to serve? If we want to do a great work for God, it's going to come out of a heart that desires to serve others. It's going to come out of a desire to go out and seek and to save that which is lost. And really that's what Jesus is you know, uh, uh, promoting here. He's saying, whosoever will be chief, let him be your servant. You know, we're not, we might not be a chief church in terms of numbers, but we can be a chief church in, in God's eyes in terms of what we can accomplish. But again, it's going to be done through 
being a servant. Be a church that is about serving other people. And not just, you know, trying to build some edifice to man, not just try to get some structure constructed on some beautiful property somewhere and just go into it, you know, and, and, and just and just sit there and enjoy this building. Because here's the thing about church buildings. They're nice, they're it's exciting when you're building it, it's exciting when it's finished, and it's exciting for a little while when you're in it, but after a while it's just another building. Yeah. Right. You know, people would walk in and say, What you guys are just this little church, it's just meeting in this little office area, you know, on uh, off the freeway and it's less to, you know, I like I think it's a nicer part of town, but it's it's an industrial war type of area. You know, it's an office, uh, you know, it's a commercial zone area. You know, there's no fountains and rivers and all these things like that around here. People would kind of scoff and mock at that and they would say, you know, what's so desirable about to go to a church like that? Well, it's because of the mission. You know, that's why the church is going to draw a certain type of person, a person who has the idea of being a servant, not somebody who's necessarily just trying to put on a show or be, you know, just be seen or be a part of something that's just about the external. <laughs> So again, a very important principle in Scripture that if you've been paying attention as we go through the book of Matthew has been coming up over and over and over and over again. Whosoever be chief among you, let him be your servant. Whosoever be elder, let him be as the younger. I mean, it's just something that's being repeated over and over again. As he says there in verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. You know, we talked about that a little bit with mothers this morning. You know, and let me just ring that bell again about how that is the call of a mother. She gives her life, she gives her own uh, ambitions and desires and, and these things that the world would say, this is what you should pursue. And she puts that aside and to do what God has commanded to do, to, to bear those children, to raise those children. And it, and it is a sacrifice and it's a life of service. But that's what God has called not only mothers, but all of us to. It's a life of service. <clears throat> Now, in verse 29, um, you know, this is kind of where I wanted to focus a little bit more with the time that we have left. Because this is kind of an interesting, just uh, uh, when we start to pick, compare it with other parallel passages from here on out in the story, uh, we can kind of get thrown for a loop a little bit if we're paying attention. And it might leave us scratching our heads exactly how these uh, passages uh, harmonize. If you look there in verse uh, 29, it says, And as they departed from Jericho... A great multitude followed him, crying out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And he behold... Uh, let me start over. Verse 29. And, and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should uh, hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? Now, whenever I read that, I kind of get a little bit of chuckle out of it. You know, and I love the way they react, and I wonder if we would react the same way. They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. I mean, isn't it a little obvious when you're blind what it is <laughs> you're looking for? You know, I mean, to me, it just seems like a... Like he's asking, uh, well, duh. I mean, was that how we might respond? Duh. You know, like, come on, isn't it obvious what we want? I mean, do you really think God doesn't know that's what they want? I mean, he, we, our Heavenly Father knoweth what things we have need of before we even ask Him. Yeah. So why does Jesus take the time to even ask this question? I think a lot of it is to so that they could make that profession of faith. Yeah. That they're saying that you could open our eyes. And it's showing them that, hey, we have faith that you're even able to do this. That's why we're here. And so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So I just thought, you know, that's kind of interesting that they that he would even ask that question. You know, why is it that he asked that? But uh, <clears throat> that's not really what I want to get into. But if you would, keep something there, and then turn over to Mark 10, and then put a finger there, and go over to Luke 18. Mark 10 and Luke 18, because these are parallel passages. And I'm going to do my best here to make sure that I make this clear and understood and exactly what's going on, because it's kind of a head-scratcher, and you've got to really kind of pay attention to the wording and, the, and when, when things are happening here in the story. So, if you're there in Mark 10 and Luke 18, you'll, if, you may have noticed this in your Bible reading that 
Matthew and Mark record this healing as happening when Jesus left Jericho. Jesus leave, is leaving Jericho and these two blind men come to him and he heals them. But if we notice that Luke records it, a, a healing of a blind man, and when he enters into Jericho, right? If you're there, um, look at Matthew 20, verse 29. As they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed them. Look at Mark 10, 46. Mark 10, 46. Maybe time to get there. Again, keep your fingers there. We're going to be going back and forth. We're going to work on your manual dexterity a little bit tonight. Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. So these, we see these healings taking place in Mark and in Matthew as he departs from Jericho. Now look at Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 35. Luke chapter 18, and verse 35. In Luke 18, verse 35, it says, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the way, uh, wayside begging. So did you see that there? How in Matthew and in Mark, he's departing Jericho. Then we find in Luke that he is coming nigh to Jericho. Well, you'd say, well, maybe it just means that he was near Jericho. You know, he was leaving, but he was nigh to it. Well, if you look at, at uh, 19 verse 1, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. So he's coming nigh to Jericho. He heals this blind man, and then he passes through Jericho. And then we see in Matthew and Mark that he's healing blind men as he's departing Jericho. So how do we explain this? How do we make these harmonize? Well, first of all, we haven't really seen anything that contradicts. It's just trying to kind of understand here. And what I think is going on, and there's, several, there's a few other explanations that I've heard, but I think what the, my personal opinion is that we're looking at two different events. We're looking at two different healings. We're seeing a, a man get healed as he's entering, and we're seeing men get healed as he's leaving. Yeah. It's not the same event. I mean, that seems pretty simple, but people will throw this out there and say, well, that's a contradiction. Yeah. But that's a real, you know, people who are quick to just throw out and say, there's contradictions in the Bible, are people gen well? They're unsaved, first of all, and here's the thing: they they want their they want contradictions to be there. And when you want a contradiction to be in the Bible, you know you're gonna you're gonna try and you're gonna twist it out of there, right? Because there is no contradiction here. It's as simple as looking at the fact that there's it's two different events. Yeah. I mean, in that talk about a duh you know moment. That's one of them. Uh, so. It's really two different events. Luke records, and we see that because if you look in Luke, it records a multitude present, right? Luke 18, 35, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh into Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and hearing the multitude, okay, that's important, passed by, he asked what it meant. Okay, so it just says multitude. Okay, that's it, just multitude. As he's walking in, the multitude, as he's coming into Jericho. Now Matthew and Mark, they record a great multitude being present, okay? Look at Matthew. I'll read for you Matthew 20, 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So we've got a multitude as he's coming near and into Jericho, and then as he's leaving, we have a great multitude, right? That's repeated in Mark 10, 46. And the, he came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Barry Midas, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. So this number has gone from a multitude to a great multitude. That's not that is, that's notable. You have to pay attention to that. Yeah. The Bible, uh, you know, is careful to describe that, going from a multitude to a great multitude. So you know, what's the first? You know, and you say, well, why is why is it like this in the Bible? Why do you have to pay such close attention to these things? Well, God allows the stories to be told like this and inspires, in fact, the the Bible to be written in this way, because when we read the Bible, there's a lot of applications that we can make. There's primary applications, there's secondary applications. You know, the Bible is a very deep book. Amen. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from, even from a story like this. For example, one application we can make is the fact that the two blind men had to wait outside the crowd that had gathered. You know, the two blind men had to wait, the ones that were on the other side of Jericho had to wait for him to pass through with that great multitude and, and wait for that healing to come. And what it's showing us is that Jesus will get to us in time. That sometimes we might have a great need in life, but we just have to be patient. And sometimes it seems like God is real busy with a lot of other things, and everybody else has a lot of other needs and concerns, and does God even care or, or wonder or know about us? 
But if we're just patient and we wait, that God gets to us. Amen. You know, sometimes we live in a world where we just want everything right now. Yeah. We want this prayer answered now. We want the solution now. And sometimes those answers to prayer, they don't come for a long time. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it often might come longer than we want. Yeah. And God is showing us here that we have to be patient. Well, you, well, you healed you healed them on the other side of Jericho. You know, you healed that guy when you were coming in. Why can't you hurry up and get here and get it over with? I know you can do it, but I have to wait. You know, we know God's capable, but even then, sometimes God makes us wait. What's another application? Well, the first blind man, the one who was healed as Jesus was coming into Jericho, right? Maybe he's the one that went and got the other two guys. He says, man, I have friends that are blind. I got these two friends, blind Bartimaeus and this other guy. You know, they're blind. Let me go get my friends and get them to Jesus. And while he's gone getting them, this great multitude comes. And they have to come to the other side of Jericho. But the point being is that they went, he went and got his two friends. And that would be something that we see consistent in Scripture. Yeah. I mean, we see that with Andrew. When, when Jesus is calling his disciples, it says that he first go and findeth his own brother Simon Peter and telleth them we have found the Christ, which being interpreted as the Messiah. So it's, it's, a, it's something that God shows us should be in our character or the nature of man that we should desire to tell others about Jesus. And Jesus, uh, you know, um, you know, we uh, even think about the demoniac, the other examples, where Jesus commands the demoniac of Gadara, he says, go tell uh, what great things God hath done for thee. I mean, God wants other people to know about him. Maybe that's the application that we can make here. Jesus wants us to tell others about him so he can do for them what he has done for us. You know, Jesus wants that blind man to go find his friends and, and meet him on the, down the road so that he can do the same thing for them. That's what God wants out of us. That's an application that we can make out of this passage here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, what I find interesting is that, you know, that really isn't a contradiction. You know, it's just something that you have to think through. It's something you have to, you know, the Bible says that uh, these things are, are, you know, the natural man receiveth not the things in the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. You know, that's why it takes this Holy Spirit to sometimes to read these stories and when we come across things like that that don't make sense, to let God lead us and, and, and show us the meaning of it. You know, that there's a deeper meaning here that we can get out of this. Uh, but what's also interesting is that Matthew record, records two blind men. If you caught that while we were reading it, he records two blind men when he comes out. There were two. But when we look in Mark, it's just the one. It's the blind Bartimaeus, right? Matthew 20, 29, as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O thou son of David. But what does it say in Mark 10, 46? And then they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat, sat by the wayside, high wayside begging. So we see, again, not necessarily a contradiction, but just a different perspective. What it is, is just a detail that's been slightly changed. You know, and really what it is, is just focusing in on, on a particular part of the story. <clears throat> now, people again will say, well, this is a contradiction. No, it's not. It's every bit, both are true. And here's how. If he healed two people of their blindness, is it is it true also that he healed one? Yep. It is. You could just as easily say that. It would, if I had two apples up here, you could say that I have an apple. You know, I have two apples. You could say, hey, go see Brother Corbin. He has an apple. Does that mean I only have one apple? No. To say I have only, that I have an apple? I could have two and have an apple. So we could see here that really it's just focusing in on one particular person of the two men. It doesn't mean that there's an, that the other one wasn't there. It just doesn't mention him in Mark. <clears throat> Mark doesn't contradict Matthew at all. It simply focuses the story on a particular man and which is something that Scripture does often. If you've ever noticed in Matthew 2, or excuse me, Matthew 8, 28, I'll just read for you. This is when they're coming into the, the land of the Gergesenes. It says here, when they came to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. You ever notice that? That there was the man, we always talk about the demoniac up there. But it says in Matthew 8 that there was two. It says there were two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. But in Mark 5, we only read of a man 
who was coming out of the tombs with an unclean spirit, who had us dwelling among the tombs. In Luke chapter 8, we also read when he's coming into the, into the country of the Gar uh, Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee, and when he went there forth the land, there met him out of the city a certain man. So we have two men in one passage, and then we have just one man. That doesn't mean the second guy wasn't there. It's just focusing in on one person. And that's the exact same way, uh, when we, the same thing, excuse me, when we read here in Matthew 20 about the fact that he's healing two in Matthew 20, and he's only healing one over here in Mark 10. <clears throat> now, we could make the application when it comes to the demoniac of Gadara that, you know, one man was worse off than the other. Maybe that's why it focused on it. Maybe he was a little bit worse off than the other guy. Maybe he'd been a demoniac just a little bit longer. And that would show us that there is a progression to demonic possession. That, that, that is a pro, that's something that has a progression to it. That it gets worse. Which again would line up with scripture. In Matthew 12 it says, When an unclean spirit has gone out of man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it uh, empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, uh, dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So there is a, you know, a progression of people who have, are uh, you know, uh, to demonic influence. Some people have it worse than others. And maybe that's why it focuses on one demoniac in certain Gospels and two in Matthew. But uh, you know, the, what we could really understand here you know, maybe on a bigger picture is the fact that the Gospels are narratives the authorship of which contains a human element. I mean, these were written by men. We say the Bible's written by God, and that's true. But remember, man, he used man, that was the human, uh, he used the human element to give us the Scriptures. So there's going to be, not. I'm not saying there's mistakes, I'm not saying there's flaws, but I'm just saying there's different perspectives. There's different ways of expressing it. There's different ways, you know, there's still the personality of the author that comes through in that. God chooses to use those particular authors and He inspires them to write what they wrote, but they also wrote from their own perspective and with their own understanding. So, there is a human element. And we know that's the way it's always been in Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So yes, uh, we receive the Scriptures by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it was holy men of old that spake uh, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you see that you know the Gospels, they often have an element of the author involved. So maybe that's why in certain passages we're reading about two people here and one person here. Two people here and one person here. Just because of the fact that the author, that's what they chose to focus in on. Now, here's the thing. When we come to the Scripture, you know, we have to come to the Scripture with faith that it is perfect. That God has preserved it in heaven. That His Word has settled forever in heaven. That He has purified it seven times. As silver is tried in a furnace of earth. That, that it is perfect, that it is whole. There's nothing we need outside of it to understand and know who God is. Amen. And if we can do that, then we can come to passages like these and say, and, and say well, there's a supposed contradiction you know, and if we understand that God's word is perfect, we'll say, no, there is no contradiction here. There is a deeper meaning here. There is a there is a greater truth to be learned from this. And if we would pray and seek God and continue to read, uh, you know, God will reveal these things to us over time. That's one of the best principles when it comes to Bible reading and Bible studies. When you come up against something you don't understand, don't beat your head against the wall. Keep reading. The answer might be in the next page. It might be in the next book. You know, it might be in the next chapter. You know, it could be right around the corner, but you're so busy over here trying to figure this one thing out in this one section when the answer is over here. You need to just keep reading, and then it'll come to you. And, you know, and when you hear that, I, I know that's been true in my own life, and you hear about people who've read the Bible scores of times, who've wondered about things for years and years and years and years of Bible reading. They've never understood certain passages. And then later, just even decades later, after years of faithful reading, They'll read another passage they've read over and over again, and then they'll finally receive understanding. Yep. Because they've grown in knowledge and wisdom and ability, and they understand uh, certain passages. So that's a great uh, you know lesson to learn from this, is the fact that if we don't understand something in Scripture, to just keep reading. Amen. You know, uh, 
when we come to the scripture in faith, understanding, and believing that it's perfect, that's when God starts to use it to reveal spiritual truths that we can apply to our lives. And you say, well, why is it that there were two, uh, or there was two uh, blind men healed, but here there's only one? You know, then we can start to see that there's spiritual truths that can be learned from that. That's when God can start to, when we can apply those things to our lives and become better Christians for it. So don't ever let anyone throw that in your face and say, well, it's a contradiction. It's actually a blessing from God. It's actually God trying to teach you something. And you know, He does that. How does He do, how does he do that? He does that by broadening and narrowing these narratives. Some of them are going to have a, a more broader view that are less detailed. Other ones are going to focus in and have more detail. Names, specific people. You know, there's, there's more to it. <clears throat> you know, and, the, and, and it's a big telltale sign. It's a good, uh, you know, how do I want to say this? It's a good, uh, a good way to check where our heart's at is how we respond to these type of things. How do we respond when we come up against a difficult portion of scripture or something that on the surface might seem like a contradiction? Do we instantly begin to panic and worry that we've been duped? The whole thing is, you know, the Bible is false. I mean, do we? You know? Not if we're right with God. Not if we trust God and know and believe this word. You know, and we shouldn't allow these type of things to frighten us and, and to and cause us to doubt, but rather we should be excited about the fact that it's an opportunity to inquire the scripture, to read the scripture, to study, and to learn something. That's right. And to apply something uh, how uh, uh, to our own lives. <coughs> so that's Matthew chapter 20 tonight. Uh, you know, I thought that was real interesting there at the end. I know there was a big section there in the middle about the main or call if you were chosen, but again, that's going to be coming up later. But there are still a lot of great lessons that we, we, we learned, uh, can learn from these, these passages. You know, and the primary thing really being that, you know, we should always come to the Scripture in faith and trust it to be what it claims to be, which is the very Word of God. And when we do that, we can start to learn and understand deeper spiritual truths from it. Let's go ahead and pray.